Hi, I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. Since we released a video on sharpening a hand plane blade, we have had tons of questions. I picked the top 10, gonna review them with you. Hope you enjoy this. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. These questions all stem from a video we did back in 2020. It was called 32 Seconds to Sharp. It wasn't intended to be clickbait. It's actually how long it takes if you're freehand sharpening to go through from dull to having an incredibly sharp blade. If you haven't watched it, I would recommend you do. We're gonna leave a link down below. And what I'm gonna do is take the top 10 questions one at a time, here comes number 10. Number 10, how do you know when to resharpen? When your blade is properly sharpened, your shaving will come off and it will be a full width shaving. See how that? As the blade edge starts to break down, couple things you're going to notice. Number one, you're going to have to start advancing the blade a little bit more in order to maintain the shaving. But then you'll also start to notice, I'm just going to do this with my fingernail. What I'm doing is just run some little indents in here. You'll see what it does to the shaving. When your shaving starts to break, the edge starts to break down, your shaving starts to get serrated like that. At that point, you know, okay, the edge is gone. I've got to go in and reestablish it. So if I were to look at the edge under that circumstance, you would see a nice straight line and it would be interrupted by little nicks. And those little nicks are what rips up the shaving. At that point, 32 seconds later, you should be back to a full width shaving. Number nine, this is a good one. There's, when do I need to regrind the primary bevel? Well, there's three primary reasons. I'll explain the most common one first. This part of the uh, bevel that has the lines on it is referred to as the, uh, the primary bevel. It's typically 25 degrees. The polished part is a secondary bevel, and right out at the very tip would be the tertiary bevel. Each time you resharpen, you're going to expand or extend that little secondary bevel, and it's going to get wider and wider. And at some point, you're actually working too much metal. So at that point, I would go back over to my bench grinder, adjust my tool rest, so it was back to paying 25 degrees, and I would regrind this primary bevel so that it goes almost to the tip. And what I mean by that is I would leave a little polished strip right out at the very end, and what that does, there's no reason to grind all the way through it, but that simply means I'm gonna get rid of all this material, get it out of the way, so my sharpening can back, be back to being nice and fast. That's the most common reason. Second, if you did some damage, if you dropped your blade or for some reason you had a really bad nick, rather than try to remove all of that material, because if you end up with a nick over here, you've got to get all the way below it, but you've got to go all the way across. So much easier to do that on the bench grinder than trying to do it by freehand on stones. And the third reason, when folks first learn to freehand sharpen, you're applying pressure with essentially four fingers on a typical plane blade, and you're accustomed to applying a lot more pressure or using your index finger a lot more than your pinky or your ring finger or your middle finger. And as a result, folks have a tendency to push harder on this corner than they do on this corner. And you end up having your blade getting out of square and now it's slightly skewed. Well, if you look at your plane, your lateral adjustment allows for some adjustment of the blade side to side so that when it projects through the throat or the mouth of the plane, it is parallel to the sole. That enables you to get a shaving that is uniform thickness from side to side. If in the process of freehand sharpening, particularly when you're first starting, you end up getting too far out of square so that you can't compensate with your lateral adjustment lever, then it's time to go back and square that edge back up again on your bench grinder. Again, that's a job you want to do on a bench grinder as opposed to trying to do it freehand. It just takes too long. That leads me into question number eight, explain your grip. And this one's really important because it's your grip that is going to make the process of sharpening 
the same every time you do it. Whether you golf, shoot a pistol, all of those things require the same grip each time. Well, here's how I do it. Being right-handed, I hold the blade with my right hand, and I kind of have my fingers in this slot. Index fingers over here, thumbs back there. I use this hole as an indexing point. So I'm going to put my left index finger in that hole. I'm going to put my ring finger, uh, pardon me, my pinky on this corner, my ring finger, my in middle finger. I'm going to move my index finger of my opposite hand over. So if we took a marker, and I sometimes do this for students when they're first starting, and I'm going to draw four circles on that blade. The idea is we want the pressure on the blade to be applied evenly spaced and applied uniformly. So by holding it like so, you can cover each one of those circles with a finger. You want to be right up at the cutting edge. And I'll talk about pressure in a moment. But in order to tie my hands together, I squeeze my left thumb, pardon me, my right thumb between my left thumb and my left index finger. Sometimes easier to see up here. And in doing that, these two hands are now tied together, and it's a lot easier to uh, have them working together when they're tied together than to have them separate like this. And then, of course, it's onto the stone, feeling for the primary bevel, elevating a few degrees in order to do your secondary and a degree or two more for your tertiary. But that's your grip, and the pressure you apply, light to moderate. If you had a firm grape and you started to push on it, the amount of pressure it would take to start to compress a firm grape would be about the amount that you're going to apply. Remember this, anytime you're using hand tools, the more grip or the more pressure you apply, the less control you have. And as you back off the pressure, you feel better. You can, do, you can feel it, what's happening through your fingers, and you're going to be far more in tune with what's happening at that cutting edge. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our newsletter has subscriber-only content monthly discount on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it, click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Number seven, why do I have to flatten my stones? Well, it's actually quite simple. So sharpening stones consist primarily of two ingredients, an abrasive, in this case, an abrasive that measures 8,000. So if you had a one inch by one inch screen, and it had 8,000 holes, these particles would fit through those holes. Those particles that cut the steel have to be held in place. So there's some kind of a bonding agent, often in a water stone, it's what we call a clay matrix, holds all those little particles together. That's a ceramic stone, just a different bonding agent. Another form of a water stone, same thing, some kind of a clay matrix. As you run the tool over the stone, the bonding agent wears away and keeps give, exposing a fresh layer of cutting particles, which keeps the cutting speed up. However, as that uh, bonding agent wears away, the stone goes out of flat. Well, if you want to get a truly sharp edge, you have to be making contact over the entire edge. If you allow that to get dished, and then you put your blade in there, you're only working on the edges, you're not going to get it nice and straight, and it just doesn't work. So you have to keep them flat. I used to tell folks, using water stones every 30 to 45 seconds, stop and give it a three, four second flattening. The ceramic stones, you can probably get away with about a minute. Now there's an exception to this, and that is the diamond stones. This is a steel plate, and it has an industrial diamond that's held in place by a nickel coating. These don't go out of flat. Yes, they eventually wear, but you never have to go in and actually flatten them. They don't dish. These ones you do, however, that's just part of the way they function. And if you do it frequently, it doesn't take a whole lot of work. You maintain nice flat stones and you get a great edge. Number six, and I'm surprised at how many times we were asked this. I employ the Charlesworth ruler trick. If you don't know about this, you are missing probably the most incredible uh, technique that has been developed for sharpening, freehand sharpening that's probably ever been had. David Charlesworth, who uh, recently passed, is the craftsman that developed it and uh, made it popular. It speeds up the process and makes it so the average person can get an incredible edge. It involves having a little thin steel rule on the side of the stone 
and then setting your blade when you do the back so that you're working on the opposite side of the stone within a quarter of an inch of the edge, elevated by that little steel rule, less than a degree, but just enough so instead of having to flatten and polish all of this, if you look, you just deal with a little wee polished strip right over there on the edge. Saves so much time. Well, it really doesn't matter how thick that steel rule is, but you do want to always use the same steel rule and you always want to keep it in the same spot and you always want to maintain that within a quarter of an inch of this edge. If you come over in here, you've really altered the angle. That steel rule that I use measures about 20 thousandths of an inch. So if it was 22, 25, 26, it really wouldn't matter. That happens to be the one that I use. The Charlesworth ruler trick. Thank you, David Charlesworth. Number five. What do you use for a lapping fluid or a cutting fluid and why? Well, that depends. Let me explain. We'll start over here. If you're using diamond plates and they go up to 8,000 grit, I don't recommend them as a finishing stone, great as a beginning stone, but I don't think the 8,000 represents a true 8,000 grit stone. If you're using that, then you can simply use some kind of a cutting fluid, usually a petroleum-based or even a light tool uh, machine oil. All you're trying to do is lubricate and keep those particles suspended so it doesn't clog the stone. If you're using a water stone or a ceramic stone exclusively, nothing else, then you can simply use water. It's all that's required. Nothing's going to rust, and it's all that's needed. Obviously, it's the reason it's called a water stone. If you're combining and you're using a water or a ceramic stone and the diamond plate, therein lies the problem. You don't want to use oil on the ceramic stone. You don't you want to use water on your diamond plate because it'll rust. Well, several years ago, I was made aware of a product called Honrite. Now, that little bottle makes uh, six liters or a gallon and a half. It's diluted, and that will lubricate both. It inhibits water from rusting metal, so it's safe to use on your steel plate, and, of course, it's safe to use on your ceramic plate. I do recommend that at the end of the day you dry them off, and preferably you leave it on your edge so that it can dry and you won't have to worry about rust. So those are your choices, water, Honrite, or some kind of a petroleum-based cutting fluid if you're just using diamond plates. Why use a water stone or diamond stone over sandpaper? And what about diamond stones versus a ceramic stone? First, the sandpaper. Um, it's a method that's relatively inexpensive because how much does a sheet of sandpaper cost? Personally, I think it's penny-wise, dollar-foolish because that sandpaper doesn't last very long. Wet, dry sandpaper is actually not that inexpensive. It's rather expensive per sheet. So over a period of time, you're going to spend a lot of money on sandpaper. The other reason I don't like it is because between the abrasive and the substrate that it's sitting on, you've got a little thick a piece of paper that's got a little bit of flex to it, and there's a slight roll you may or may not see as you're pushing, particularly if you're doing the back, that you're pushing that little roll, particularly on a chisel, and it's going to cause the uh, back to wear away just a little more right on the cutting edge than perhaps back here. Not such a big deal on a plane blade, but on your chisels, you want that back to remain nice and flat. So for that reason, I'm not a fan of sandpaper. Now, diamond stone versus ceramic. I mentioned earlier Diamond stones are great if they're your first stone, meaning your core stone for establishing the secondary bevel. Again, I'm referencing back to our video, 32 Seconds to Sharp, where it explains all of that. However, my experience with diamond stones, once you get above 1,000 grit, they're not as fine as what is stated. My best experience has come from using the Shapton 16,000 grit. And I'm going to explain that a little bit later because it comes into another question but this will give you the best edge. I like the fact that it's hard. So there is, no, there is no little wave being created, like I mentioned on the sandpaper. A hard back stone will do the best job at producing a nice straight edge. When I say straight, shortest distance between two points, I want my edge to be straight from here to here, 
and I want me, my edge to be straight as I look down the line. Now I treat, uh, I feather the outside corners, again, mentioned in our 32 seconds of sharp video, but the rest of it I want it to be nice and straight. I prefer to plane my board so that each overlapping pass disappears into the next and you end up with a surface that is flat and flawless. That's what I prefer. Number three, does my method or the method that I teach in 32 seconds to sharp work on bevel up planes? Let me quickly explain. So if I were to take this plane apart by removing the lever cap, taking the blade and chip breaker, chip breakers on the top, you'll notice that the bevel is on the bottom side. That is typical of what we call bench planes. However, on block planes or some bench planes, low angle bench planes are they're referred to, the blade is set in such a way that the bevel is on the top side. Does the method work? Well, there it is on my block plane. You see the little tertiary and secondary, and over here you see the back bevel where we've gone in, and again, set that blade down on the steel rule, raise less than a degree, very, very minor change, but instead of having to polish all of this, still works fine, and as I mentioned, it's such a small change, it's not even noticeable, so yes, you can use it on bevel down, bevel up, whatever you like. Number two, why go to 16,000 grit? What's wrong with 8,000 or even 6,000? Well, let me, it only stands to reason that the higher the grit, the better the surface. I've got some sandpaper here. There's a piece of 120 grit. There's a piece of 180. There's a piece of 400. If you're going to finish a piece of maple, are you going to get a better finish with the 400 than the 180 or the 120? Of course you are. Same is true on your cutting edge. The finer the cutting edge, the better the surface. Now there are some limitations, so let's talk about them. 6,000 and 8,000. Let's put the six aside and just concentrate on this. A lot of folks will go to 8,000. That's very common. Shapton provides 16,000. The difference, so what I do is look at the cost, the speed with which it cuts, and number one is the surface that it leaves behind. So my first concern is what's the surface going to feel like? Well, if I were to plane this side of the piece of walnut sharpened up to 8,000 and this side of a piece of walnut sharpened up to 16,000, you could run your fingers like this and tell the difference. So I want the best. Now I'm going to interject right here. Somebody else asked, what about the 30,000? Well, the 30,000 is almost double the 16,000. However, there's going to be a limitation in where you're going to be able to see or feel the difference with the unaided hand or eye. Well, not only that, but it is a cost factor. So let me come back to that. The 8,000 is not that much less expensive than the 16,000, maybe 30% more. However, stone's gonna last you, let's say it only lasts you five years. They both are gonna cut about the same speed. I prove that when I teach my sharpening. If I were to stop at the 8,000, I would spend 10 seconds on that final edge. If I went to 16,000, I would also spend 10 seconds and the proof is in the pudding. So there's not much difference in cost, there's not much difference in speed, but there is definitely a difference in the end result. Now, if you were to look at the 30,000 grit stone, it's more than double the price of the 16,000. It's gonna last about the same time, doesn't take a whole lot longer to do the edge with the 30 as it does the 16, but the difference is this. If I had planed this edge with a 16,000 grit finish, and this edge with the 30,000, you're not going to rub the two and tell the difference. We just can't find that, feel that fine. It looks fantastic on the back of a chisel, but you have to decide, is it worth spending that much more money? So for your money, 16,000 offer, off is the best value. Best edge, considering all those other factors, time of sharpening and the cost of the stone, 16,000. So the number one question, this is my favorite one to answer. Why sharpen freehand instead of just using a jig? Let me show you what I mean. There's a very typical jig and there are lots of them out there. This one is simple. You put the blade in there, you tighten it up, you get the angle correct, it holds it for you and you simply move that forward and back. Well, I could sharpen with this for 10 years 
and if this jig broke, I'd have to replace it because I have not learned anything about sharpening. I was simply the motor that moved it back and forth. Why do we woodwork? Well, I'll make reference to this dovetail. Did it all by hand. And whether anybody else cares, at the end of the day, I can look at that and feel a great level of satisfaction knowing that my skill, combined with some good tools, was able to produce this. If you're sharpening with a jig, you're not learning a skill, you're not developing your ability to sharpen, and as I mentioned, break your jig, 10 years from now, you're still going to have to go buy a new jig. Why not spend the time to add to your skills, learn to sharpen freehand, you could argue that it's faster, it's far more convenient. I can go from having a dull blade to go over there for 32 seconds, put my blade back together and I'm back to work. But I think the number one reason is you're developing a skill and most of us would work because we enjoy the process of building, which really means we enjoy the process of developing a skill set that allows us at the end of the day to sit back and admire what we've been done. I hope this helps. We'll do it with some of our other videos. Good luck. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.